And I think uh, some of what I say may overlap a little bit with some of the previous sessions. So, because we'll talk a little bit about also prioritizing your goals in, in terms of time management. I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, and I don't have a handout for this because what I did was I put everything on a tab on uh, my website, which is pemsource.org. Uh, PEMSource is all about pediatric emergency medicine. That's what I do. Uh, I'm peds trained and then emer peds emergency medicine trained, so I always tell the applicants I don't see those crazy adults or smell their smelly feet. Um, <laughs> so I'm all about pediatric emergency medicine, and I decided to put everything on this wellness tab. And really, uh, we'll talk in a sec, time management is sort of an aspect of wellness. So all you have to do to find all of that I'm going to present is to go to this tab, and then all the links will be there. And I'll keep updating it as I find more interesting things to add. Um, so you've probably seen these studies. Emergency medicine has a very high burnout rate, in fact, the highest. And this, the purple and orange bars are two separate years, 2011, 2014. So we're back-to-back -back winners, yay. Um, <laughs> But also, if you look at things such as uh, those specialties who say they have enough time for their personal time and their family time, we actually rank pretty highly on that, too. So that's good. So the good things about emergency medicine are we have some flexibility to our time. And if we manage it well, then we can achieve time management and work-life balance, even in the face of the fact that a lot of emergency medicine physicians are burnt out. And I personally think that being in academic emergency medicine, you're getting away from some of those burnout issues, which is great. Because staying away from burnout means enjoying what you're doing, loving what you're doing. And I think part of being in an academic emergency medicine and making that choice is being able to find your niche and what you love to do that's separate from patient care and keeps you from being burnt out. So when you look at the drivers of burnout from, from those those articles, you can see them here. And it's a little bit of a vicious cycle. So the vicious cycle is you don't feel like you're good at what you're doing. That's what we were talking about in the last session. You're not productive. You don't feel like you're achieving your goals. You're not publishing that paper. You're not finding that mentor. And then you start to feel burnt out. You don't feel like you have enough time for doing what you want to do. You get exhausted. And then that kind of feeds into a vicious cycle where you remain unproductive because you're feeling burnt out. What you want to do is get into a productive cycle where you feel very accomplished, you feel engaged in what you're doing, you're enjoying what you're doing, you have a mentor that's engaging you, and then you're achieving and you feel great about that. And then that makes you more engaged and more achieving more. So we want to be on the right side of this diagram where we're engaged and productive and not burnt out. And if you look at some of the drivers of burnout, there are things like workload and job demands, efficiency, work-life integration or balance. Those are things that I'm going to be touching on with time management that we can work on for ourselves. Some things we may have less control, like our organization, our support systems, and we have to just look at that and see if that's something that is being a big driver of burnout for us. Maybe we need to make changes in our, in our work. But we can control, in some ways, our workload and our job demands, our efficiency and resources, our work-life balance. Um, so out of all of this talk of burnout, I think everybody knows there's this big concept of wellness, right? And um, all these words that kind of come out with wellness, they talk about things that you should do. And we look at that and we say, well, yeah, I'd like to exercise and I'd like to sleep and I'd like to eat healthy. Uh, but what do all these things require? They require time. So here are a list of things that people often look at and say, here are things that you should do to have a nice, balanced life, to avoid burnout, to remain productive. Um, you got to eat healthy. You have to be satisfied with your work, exercise regularly, get a good amount of sleep, spend time with friends and family, still have some self-care, some hobbies for yourself, maybe have some mindfulness activities. And all of those require time. So what, that is the 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 focus of my talk and also something that you can help you get all of those things if you manage your time well. Uh, first, and I think this goes to some of the other sessions you've had, you need to take a step back though because you can create a lot of time for yourself by being more efficient and organize all the things that we're going to talk about. But if you take all that time and you spend it doing something that doesn't feed your goals, then you haven't really become more productive. You're not going to get in that productive cycle feeling good about yourself. 
So for an example, and it's very easy to fall into this. Uh, there was a point in my career where I took over doing an administrative duty. It just involved reviewing a lot of charts, chasing down residents to review charts, gathering all that data, and making some sort of metrics report to the hospital. And that became my thing. And I'm very good at it. I'm good at metrics. I'm good at numbers. So I became the person that did this. That was doing nothing for my career. It was not driving my goals forward. It was just really busy work that I was doing. And it took me some time to kind of realize, yes, I was efficient with my time. I was getting this done. But I was spending a good amount of time doing something that really wasn't helping me and my career in any way. So I needed to go back to my mentor, my chair, and say, look, is there any way we can automate this? Is there any way we can do this in a different way? This isn't really forwarding my goals, and it's not actually really using my skills well for something that I can achieve. So it's important to set our goals, and then we can create the time to achieve them. Uh, you may have heard we used to talk about something called the triple threat. And so the triple threat was to be a good academician, you had to be a strong clinician, a strong educator, and then they would put researcher, or I would say now a scholar. Uh, this is a wide variety of scholarly activity that you can achieve in terms of educational curricula, um, administrative, ED flow, all kinds of ways that you can achieve. But there really is another triple threat, and that is work-life balance. And really, all three of the blue circles then feed into the one pink circle. That's your work. Now you also have your family and friends, your relationships, your social time. And then you have self-care. And I think that's the one that we tend to let go of the easiest. So we ignore ourselves. We stop exercising. We ignore our hobbies. We don't read books for pleasure. We're just reading journals and back, um, background articles. And so it's important to, to find our balance amongst the three circles on the right and to make sure that we are balancing that triple threat. And so this is an article that I felt was really helpful. A lot of stuff about time management will come from the business world. And so they are very good at, at helping people become good time managers in the business world because productivity is so important. And I think these are really helpful questions to ask yourself. I think this gets back to some of the questions that I heard in the last session. Sitting down and thinking, what gives me energy, engages me, and how often am I doing those things? So if you look and you say, when someone offers me this, I feel my heart pump a little bit. I'm excited. I know I want to do that. And when someone else offers me that, I know it'll be good for me and it might be good for my career, but I'm really not excited. And really deciding for yourself, what is it that I want to get into if I had two extra hours a day, what would I spend them doing? What would really get me excited? Um, what are a few things that I need in my life to be happy and healthy? My husband has to be able to run. He just has to. So he has to make time for himself. He knows he has to have that time. Um, maybe it's I really want to have a meal every day, one meal a day with my family. Or I really want to be the coach of my kids' soccer team. That's important. I'm going to carve out that time. I need to make my schedule fit so that I can do that. You need to decide what are the things that are really important to you, both in your home and in your work life, and write those down. And then 10 years from now, if I looked back at my current work-life balance, would I have regrets? And if you talk to people of the senior level, sometimes you will hear that. And I think that's an important thing with a mentor as well, is to have a mentor that has good work-life balance that you would want to emulate. Um, one of my mentors, who's Roger Lewis, is um, he was mentoring me. And he was a good example of somebody who was very supportive to me in terms of work-life balance. And early in my career, he wanted me to go somewhere where he was going to introduce me for networking. And I was going to have a lot of good opportunities come out of this. And my son fell and got a huge hematoma, which, of course, as a pediatric emergency medicine doctor, I should know was fine. But when you're a mother, it's completely different. And I remember calling him. I was crying. I, was like, I, don't, I just I don't think I can leave him right now. And he was very understanding to that. Um, and I think that comes out of a mentor that has good work-life balance and has your thought, is thinking of you, uh, first and foremost. On the other hand, there was somebody else at my institution who wasn't my mentor, but who was sort of offering to mentor me in a different department. And he met with me, and he said, you know, what I like to do is I spend some time with my wife and daughter, and then I go to bed, and I get up at 3 in the morning, and I work really hard. Um, and then that's how I get things done. And that really wasn't mentorship that spoke to me. 
um, that didn't fit with my personal work-life balance. So I think finding a mentor that will be able to help you that is living the life that you would like to leave, live in terms of work-life balance is important. And I think you can take these questions and you can do them every so often. So you may have one set of answers right now and five years later. How many of you have kids? So there's some people here with kids. So a lot of this does have to do with work-life balance with kids. Five years later, things may have changed. You know, your spouse may have a different job that requires more time or less time. You may be in a different position. Um, you may surprise yourself in how much time you want to spend with your children or things may change in your life, your goals. So it's good to just repeat this every so often and see where you are. And so once you have all those questions kind of answered for yourself, you want to, and this is one of the things that sounds really hokey, but it really is helpful to actually write down those goals. You don't have to show anybody, but it is really helpful to actually write down your secret goals somewhere on a piece of paper. This is how you're going to hold yourself accountable. This is how you're going to look at something and say, should I say no to this? You know, look back at those goals. So, You'll hear this in time management, you'll hear this in business presentations, and, and it sounds really hokey and you don't feel like you really want to do it, but I would highly suggest that you actually write down your work goals. I would like to be a program director in 10 years. I would like to finish this project, do this project, publish those, and then write a grant application based on that work. I would like to be promoted to associate professor. I would like to be a part of this committee at SIEM and rise to a leadership position in that committee. Whatever your goals are that you work out for yourself or with your mentor, it can be very helpful to write those down so you can hold yourself accountable. But you also want family goals and self-care goals. So I want to exercise twice a week. I want to attend this yoga class every week, rain or shine. I want to have a meal a day with my family. I want to coach my kid's soccer team. Or I want to volunteer in the school. Um, whatever your goals are going to be in those realms as well, because remember, our triple threat includes our work-life balance and our family care and our social care, our self-care. So writing down your mission statement and goals. And I, I love this. This is a Japanese concept, ikigai. Um, very popular right now, all the Japanese concepts, like Marie Kondo. I'm sure you've heard that as well. Um, but I like this, when you're looking for the intersection of these four circles, what you love, what you love to do, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, we all have to be paid for, and what you are good at. Okay, so in emergency medicine, I think we're lucky because the world needs us. And we can pretty much be paid for, you know, we can make arguments about how much we're being paid, but in general, we are at least being compensated for what we're doing. So we've got two of the circles down already. If you're not doing what you love, all the time management in the world is probably not going to help you. So you need to figure out what you love and make sure that you are gearing your career towards that, right? If you're not doing what you love, you're comfortable, but you have a feeling of emptiness. Again, that's going to drive into burnout, right? If you're feeling empty and unfulfilled, you don't really have the get up and go to do what you will need to do, you're not productive, and you get into that cycle of burnout. Um, so that is something to find for yourself what you really enjoy. Now let's assume now that you found what you love, then the last circle is what you're good at. And what drives feeling that you're good at something is achieving and being productive. And time management can help you be productive. So like they said, all of you are actually good at what you want to do. When we've come this far, we went to medical school, we got through everything, we're here, we got the academic job, probably wouldn't have been hired if you weren't good at what you did. So we're all good at it, but we don't feel good at it sometimes. We feel like we have this imposter syndrome. And some of the drivers of that is not feeling that we're productive and not being efficient with our time. And so if you can get into that cycle of productivity where you accomplish something, you're checking things off your list, then you feel like you're good at something, and then you achieve ikigai because you have all four circles. So time management can be part of feeling like you're good at what you're doing. So then moving into time management, I don't know about you, but I would always get excited when I saw in the women's magazines that I read, uh, or our magazines in general, there's articles about how to get that extra time. You know, it's always like, 
how I am the woman that does everything and has my kids and achieves and work. And then I open excitedly, and what it says is get up an hour earlier every day. And that's just not me. So, and I actually um, read a book that was recommended by Dr. Hochberger over the weekend, What Most Successful People Do Before Breakfast, which was great and has a lot of really great stuff in it, but it was about getting up an hour earlier each day and doing stuff before breakfast. Um, so I became interested in time management to look at some of the things that you could do besides getting up an hour earlier um, each day. And these are the time management tools that we'll go over and that are the different tabs on the website that I created. Um, and this is just different things I've gotten from various articles I've read, books I've read, um, you know, sites that I've, websites that I've found that I've linked to. And these are the sort of the core time management tools that I've found. So first, you need to find where all your time is going. And when they've done studies of people in the workplace, and we are probably no different, they find that people spend three hours of their eight-hour workday doing frittering away time. Things like email, social media, on the internet. Uh, they actually find that fantasy football is a big time suck in some areas. Um, but I don't know if you know this, uh, if this has happened to you. Let's say you look at your schedule and you're like, I have this day in the office. It's an eight-hour day. I'm going to get so much done. I don't have a shift. I'm not post-call. I don't have any meetings. This is so great. I'm going to get so much done. And you go in, and then at the end of that day, you're like, ah, what happened? Why didn't I get as much done? I thought I was going to have that chapter finished by the end of this day. And you really didn't have it. And that is because sometimes we do let our time go to unproductive things. Things like email, someone comes in, they want to tell you about a great case they saw, they want to ask you about this or that minor thing that's happening. Can you write this policy? Can you respond to this? Can you check on that? And before you know it, the date, our day is gone. So one thing that time management experts recommend, and this is another thing that feels a little hokey to do, but if you're looking at yourself and you're saying, I'm really not being as productive as I want to be, this can be really helpful. Um, and it is to just write down for one week what you're spending your time on. Um, you can do it in an app, and I have some, some links on the website, or you can do it just on a paper log, which might just be easier. And uh, what the most successful th thing people do before breakfast, the author, Laura Vanderkam, she has an online log that goes by 15-minute increments even. But just writing down what you're spending your time doing for a, for a whole week, and then you can look and you can analyze and you can see, okay, you know, I'm really actually spending a lot of time on this, putting together this metric for the hospital that I'm not sure anyone's even looking at anymore. You know, I've, I've kind of just fallen into this rut of doing this. Or I'm really spending a lot of time helping these people with issues that come up for them. Maybe I need to just teach them how to work on that themselves and kind of gain a little independence there. Um, I'm really spending a lot of time on Facebook. I have to admit it. Maybe I'm doing that, and I can see that now. Uh, I'm not spending as much time sleeping as I thought I was. I, I really need to do that for my own wellness. Or I am not getting the exercise in that I wanted to get in. Um, you can look and find your most productive times. So what I took from that book, what the most successful people do before breakfast, is the before breakfast time is a time period where you can have some peace and quiet and get some work done. So the kids aren't up. Um, you're not trying to watch TV with your spouse. You, you know, exercise classes aren't happening, maybe. You, it's, there's no interruptions. If you went into the office, people are not walking into your door yet. It's 5 AM or whatever. That is a period of time when you can concentrate and really get something done. So find that time. For me, that time is actually from 10 PM to 2 AM. So my household goes to sleep, not my teenagers now, but you know she's off doing her own thing with her door closed and her phone. But anyways, so the house has gone to sleep. I'm a night owl. I'm not getting up before breakfast to do things. But that's my time, 10 PM to 2 AM. I know I can really concentrate on something and get something done. Finding that time for yourself. And the time log can help you find that productive time. And then you can match your tasks that really require focus and require you to do something to really achieve to that time period. So they talk about in that book um, using that time to write. Writing is something that we tend to push off. Right? It's, it doesn't have any due date. It's a little hard to get into. It's something that we can kind of push to later. And we really need to focus. So if people are interrupting us, we don't get anything done with that. 
or exercise. That may, maybe sometimes is a good time to exercise. You can really just carve out that time for yourself. Maybe it's self-meditation. Maybe for self-care, that's a time you need. But using the time log can help you find the peace and quiet time, the chunk for yourself, and then match the activities to that chunk that you need to get done. Um, it also can tell you when you're wasting time, when you're doing activities that maybe you can, we'll talk about delegate, when you're doing low, um, low value activities, and if you're spending a good chunk of your time on low value activities, and we'll look later at the boxes. So this is highly recommended. Do this for a week, kind of re reset yourself, and then, again, this is something you may want to repeat every few years, because you can fall into a rut again where you're doing a low value activity, because you've always done it. You're the person who does that in the department. And then when you look at it, you realize how much time you're spending. And is anybody really getting anything out of that activity that you're doing? Do they still really need that information? And you can go back to your supervisor and say, I'm really spending a lot of time on this. It's not forwarding my career. Is this something that's really important still to the department? Is there a different way that we can do this and get this information? Um, so Stephen Covey, who writes The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, this is the Covey time management matrix. I think this is a really helpful thing to think about, too. So there's the urgent and important box. And that's things like shifts. I mean, you've got to go to your shifts, right? Things that come up that are very urgent, important things in family as well. You have deadlines you have to meet. Um, the not urgent important box is where all the good stuff is. That's where all the stuff where you're going to advance your career is. That's writing your publications. That's finishing your research. But it's not urgent because there's no definite deadline, right? That I want to write that publication can be on your to-do list for a year. A year goes by and you realize, oh, I still haven't done that. Um, and so we tend to put that off. And we let the urgent, not important things take precedence. And so those are things that are, they seem urgent because someone comes in your office and they're acting like it's urgent. <laughs> and they're saying, hey, can you do this? Um, it might be somebody else's problem. It might be a relatively minor thing for the department that someone's asking you, hey, can you do this? It needs to be done by Friday. Um, it might be some metric for the hospital. It might be something that a secretary is asking you. I don't understand this. Can you explain to me? You know, it might be a resident coming in and asking you to help them with something and they haven't really fleshed it out. And you might need to just sort of redirect them a little bit and send them out to work on it on their own, whereas our tendency may be to take over and really work with them and do all of it. So there's a whole host of urgent, sort of seemingly urgent, but not important activities, activities that don't advance your career at all. And those are the ones that we tend to let use up our time in the office. And we're letting go of the important activities that don't have a deadline. So it's important for us to, and then there's the not urgent, not important activities, and that's our Facebook time and our fantasy football and our Netflix binges. And you got to have a little bit of it. You have to have a life, but you do have to look at your time management log and see if you're spending an inordinate amount of time on the not urgent, not important time. So what can be really helpful after you do your time management log and you've set your goals and you know what you want to do is to categorize your activity in these boxes. And then figure out how much time you're spending in each box and try to get more of your time up in that upper right-hand box. And we'll talk about different ways with time management that you can try to get out of some of your other boxes. So the urgent, important stuff you just have to do. The not urgent but important stuff for your career, you need to decide that you're going to get it done and create yourself a deadline because you have to try to make it urgent. The not important but seemingly urgent stuff, we we'll try to delegate, we'll try to say no to, we'll talk about some of those things that we can do. And then the not urgent, not important stuff, we'll try to let, let go a little bit, do a little bit less of that, so drop it. Um, this is a great article by Ruben Stray, uh, no, by Salima Reze and Rebel Yam. I don't know if I say his name correctly. Um, but he, he talked about getting things done in a hyper-distracted world. A lot of it has to do with tech. Uh, but he did talk about this, and he said, ask yourself, and this has got to somebody asked, how do you decide when to say no? Okay, so is this activity enjoyable? Is it really of interest to me? Am I, is it going to float my boat, get me excited, I'm eager to work on it? Because if you're not, you're going to procrastinate, and then it's going to sit on your to-do list for a long time, and it's going to bother you, and you're going to feel like you're not productive because you see that on your to-do list, and you know, oh, I've got to do that, but I don't really want to. So 
when it gets you excited, you know you're going to work on it. Is this something that will be helpful to my career, or at least helpful to my department? Is it going to get me some notoriety, some networking? Is it going to get my mentor or my chair to look favorably on me? Is it going to get me some, some like good, good karma out there, right? So is this going to help me in some way with my career? Or am I going to be compensated for this, either in money or in time? Because if you get time back, then that can buy you other time to do other things. So I think they talked about um, with Wendy when she was able to get some money from the dean's office at UCLA to do something she loved, it was able to buy her out of some shifts. So she created some time with that money as well so that she could get everything done, right? You want at least two out of three sides of this triangle for you to be taking up the activity. And I think a lot of times, particularly with junior faculty, it's not something you love but someone's offering it to you. They're, like she said, they're excited about it, and you kind of feel like you should say yes because it's someone more senior. Um, it's not necessarily going to help your career, and you can talk to your mentor and talk, say, like, is this something that will help my career? And they can kind of help you focus on that. Um, and it's not going to give you anything extra. You're just giving your time for free. So if that's the case, all three sides of the triangle are not being met, that's really something you should say no to. Uh, so this is something that can help you decide with each activity whether it's something that's something you should spend time on. Okay, so moving into actual time management tools. One of those is prioritizing and saying no. And we touched on this in the last session a little bit. So when to say no. We just talked about looking at whether it's in the wrong box. Is it something that is not important? And even though if it seems urgent, it's not going to advance your career. Is it something that doesn't meet the two sides of the triangle test? Um, you can talk to your mentor and you ask your mentor, is this something that will be helpful to me? Is it something that you can actually meet the deadline? And this is a big one. So they ask you, hey, can you write this chapter? And you're like, oh, yeah, that's great. It would be great for me to do that. And you're not really going to be able to meet the deadline. You don't want to become that person that they have to chase down to finish the chapter because they're not going to ask you to write anything more after that. So you do want to make sure that you can accomplish what's being asked of you. So making sure that you are going to be able to meet that deadline and do a good job. Um, sometimes someone will come to you with a very vague project and really what they want you to do is they want you to do all the legwork. So they have a great idea, right? Let's do this. This, this will happen to junior faculty from senior faculty. This is a great idea. Somebody should study X, Y, and Z. Do you want to do that? And they haven't really thought out how they would study it. They haven't done the background literature. They haven't put together the, the thoughts of how to do it. And they're asking you to do that. Now, if it's something that you love and you think it will advance your career and it is a great idea, sure, run with it. But if it's somebody else's idea that's very vague in the planning stages and really what they're asking is for you to do all the legwork, that may not be helpful to you or your career. And that is, again, something that your mentor should be able to help you figure out. Um, something that's really not in your wheelhouse, and they talked about that as well, right? So if you're gearing towards expertise in abdominal emergencies and they're asking you to do something about stroke, you might want to say no to that. And again, there's opportunities that are so great that you don't say no, but in general, you want to keep yourself focused. And this is where you can get that written list out again, right? And say, like, OK, this is what I said I wanted to do. This activity is not meeting the criteria on this list. I need to say no to this. Um, weighing the yes to stress ratio. So looking at exactly how much time it's going to take to do this, how, much, how stressful it's going to be. Dr. Hochberger talked about needing to be able to work with all the different organizations when he took that activity on. And then being honest with yourself, for Dr. Hochberger, I don't think that was that stressful. He's a very social guy. He loves bringing people together. That's his strength. For another person, that might be much more stressful, someone who doesn't like conflict, someone who doesn't want to be political between organizations. So your personal stress and then how much that activity is going to cause stress for you. So now if you, oh, I like this quote. Um, this is from a great book called This Side of Doctoring, Reflections from Women in Medicine. And this, this woman said, in the big picture, there is still time to write papers, network, attend national meetings, and give grand rounds. But if you did not take the afternoon off to go to your child's second grade play, that opportunity is lost forever. And what I think this really brings home is that every time you say yes to something, you're really saying no to something else. 
And that's an important thing to remember as well. So you have a finite amount of time. And if you say yes to a lower value activity, to something you didn't really want to do, you really are saying, no, I'm not going to exercise. No, I'm not going to go to the second grade play. No, I'm not going to do some of those things that I put on my list as my family and self-care goals. And it's probably your self-care goals. Those are going to be the first to go. So remember that saying yes to something means saying no to something else. And it can help you say no to that thing. Uh, so how do you say no? And we talked about, they touched on this. And there are some more thoughts. And on the website, I have a link to a business website that kind of goes through various ideas about how to say no as well. But some of the big ones is the good cop, bad cop. So who can be your bad cop? Your mentor can be your bad cop. Your spouse can be your bad cop. Your division head can be your bad cop. Your children can be your bad cop. You know, I, I, I would love to do that. My husband will be so angry at me if I'm not able to do X, Y, Z with the family. I'm really sorry. Um, I would love to do that. I've talked with my mentor. He really wants me to focus in this area. I'm really sorry I don't think I'm be able to do that. Um, so you're the good cop, but you can kind of get your team of bad cops in gear so that you can say no. Uh, they talked a little about the no sandwich. Yes, something really positive. Oh, thank you so much for thinking of me. No, unfortunately, my bandwidth, I'm just really too full right now. But I would be happy to do something in the future. I think I'll be more free in June. Um, yeah, oh, thank you so much for thinking of me. No, that's really not my area of expertise. But if you have anything in abdominal emergencies, boy, I'd love to do something on that. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Unfortunately, my calendar is so full in that month. Uh, but I would love to come out and speak for your program. You know, is there any dates in September that I could do that? Um, and that's the same thing as the kind of a no, but yes. No, I really can't do that, but I would love to do this. No, I can't be an editor. I would love to do a chapter, though. I can do one small part of it. Um, no, I, I can't teach in that whole course, but maybe I could teach in October. Something in the future, some smaller part of it, something that's more in your wheelhouse. So. No, I am a team player. I absolutely want to do something with you. I just can't do this one particular activity right now. Um, having a stock excuse, if you just panic, then you can do something to sort of buy some time. Like if you're just, ah, you know, like, OK, well, let me check with my mentor. Let me check my calendar. But really, like they say, the best thing is to just say no right away. Um, we think, my, my husband was offered a job uh, when he was first out of fellowship, and he really agonized over taking it or not taking it, which way to go. And after a lot of agony, he, he turned them down. And they basically said, uh, thank you. Do you have your colleague's phone number? They, they, they didn't care that much. They had a list, and they just moved on to the next guy. So it's, you're doing the person a favor if you just go ahead and say no firmly, quickly, get it over with, and they can get on with getting someone to do whatever it is that they need to get done. Um, lastly, what I don't have on here is you can um, try to pass the buck uh, this, you know, carefully. But if there's someone that you know that would really benefit from this opportunity, you can consider suggesting that they approach that person. So maybe someone in your department, that really is in their wheelhouse. You think that that's something that they would really want to do. Then you can, you can pass it on to them. Uh, second in our time management tools is getting rid of distractions and procrastination. So our generation particularly, or your generation really, I'm much, much older than you, is we get uh, very distracted with our technology and our mobile phones. And the next generation is going to be really distracted with this, my daughter and my sons. Um, and I don't know if you know, but iPhones have uh, this app called Screen Time now. And you can actually take a look at how much time you're spending on your screen. Um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, as you can see. I, I blame Seth Truger. Um, <laughs> and I blame Michelle Lynn. But uh, you, know, do you, do you can look and see where you're spending time. Be honest with yourself. Uh, see if you're being too distracted. And that's where your time log can come in as well. And there are a lot of great apps. Um, so one of them is Freedom, but there are several others that will monitor how much time you're spending on particular programs. And will actually, you can program it to block you. So you can block yourself. So you can say to yourself, look, I found this chunk of time. This is my peace and quiet time. This is where I'm going to write. I know I tend to get distracted with Facebook or email or Google or whatever. I'm going to use this app, and I'm just actually going to block myself. And you can see in that third thing, they set two hours, two hours of block time. Uh, keep yourself off your phone and make sure that you are going to concentrate on whatever it is that you said you would do. So you can use these apps both to see how much time you're spending on particular programs and also to block yourself from programs. 
Um, you can do this on the computer as well. So there's this program, Rescue Time. There's a lot of other ones, and Freedom has a computer uh, part of it too, where you can look and see, what am I spending my time on on the computer? Am I doing a lot of internet shopping? Is Amazon coming up a lot? Um, am I on Facebook? Am I just doing random internet searches? Am I reading CNN news? Am I looking at the latest political things that are happening? And you can also block yourself. And so again, when you find, and it doesn't have to be the whole day, right? You're going to find your chunk of high quality time where you're really going to get something done. And you're going to block yourself just for those few hours. And then you can really become productive with those hours. Uh, I also, oh, I, I, I'll show this later, but um, there is this great little app uh, where you can actually plant a tree. On, it, it's like you plant a tree, a virtual tree, and your tree won't grow unless you stay on that app. So you can't really go to any other apps on your phone. So you got to get your tree growing. And you can tell how productive you've been and how much you've managed to stay off your phone by your, you know, your little forest growing. Um, <laughs> it, the other thing about distractions you'll find when you're in the office is the people who just come to your office. And we want to be social and we want to be part of the department. But sometimes, again, when you have that little block of time that you're really going to be productive, you need to work, right? And so that's the kind of issue where people are coming in, hey, I saw this great case. I want to talk to you about it. Oh, this came up, and I can't believe Ortho's doing this. We've got to create a policy. What do you think? Um, and, and so sometimes you just have to close your door to really get stuff done. Um, you want to make sure that you're working at work. And there's a quote, another book I read that's great, called Eat That Frog. And the premise of that is the frog is the thing that you really need to get done, and you need to just eat that frog and get it over with. Um, but he talks about having a quality time at work, making sure your work is quality time to create quantity time at home. And I think we, you do a lot of reverse of that in work-life balance. People talk about having quality time with your kids, right? Kids don't really respect quality time that much. They, you can't go to your teenager and be like, I want some quality time with you right now. Let's have some deep conversation. They're just like, eh, yeah, whatever, mom. Right? So you have to kind of just be around, and that quality time sort of magically arises at some point. But you don't get to schedule it. So what you need is quantity time with your home and your life and your family and quality time at work, getting stuff done at work. And that might mean closing the door. It might mean going somewhere else to work, like the coffee house or library. I had what I called my Starbucks office. Um, if you have a long commute, if you can do that on public transportation or even have a driver, it sounds excessive. But if it means you're going to be so much more productive, it might be worth it. And you can get work done on the commute. Um, people can dictate things on their commute. Um, people can listen to podcasts on their commute. And I've even known somebody who, when they really needed to get a big project done, something like a grant application, she would get a hotel room in her own town, just away from her five, five kids. Um, and she would just go off, you know, with her spouse's blessing, of course, for a weekend in the hotel room and hammer that baby out. So sometimes you just really need to get your, close yourself off so that you can get the work done. Um, in terms of procrastination, and again, that book, Eat That Frog, is great for that. Here are some ideas. They're all on the website. Um, there was an article I read called Tuesdays to Write, which is great. Basically, scheduling your time for that writing. So those things that are in that upper right box that are not urgent because they have no deadline, but they're important to you, you need to get them done, you really need to schedule time. Literally put it on your calendar. I'm going to write from this time to this time. And if you open your calendar and those blocks are all there, when someone's asking you to do something, you can say, look, look at my calendar. It's full. I, I have all these things scheduled. I don't have time, unfortunately. But you, if you don't schedule the time, and people always talk about that with your spouse and your children as well, right? If you don't schedule those dates with your spouse, if you don't schedule that time, it, it, that's the first thing to fall away. If you don't sign up for that exercise class, you don't go, right? So you need to schedule it ahead of time. Um, the other huge thing that I find is really helpful is checklists and breaking everything down to small tasks. So if your to-do list says, write this manuscript, it's overwhelming. But if you take that idea and you write, break it down into huge checklists, write the introduction. And maybe even within write the introduction, there's like, do the background literature, read the background literature, uh, you know, compose the first paragraph, whatever. And you've written it all in this huge checklist. And then you take that two-hour block that you've set aside, and you get a couple of those things off, and you check them off. That feeds back into that cycle of productivity. Now you see your progress you're making. You feel good about yourself. You feel like you're good at what you're doing. You feel 
engaged in your work, and then it feeds into that cycle of productivity. Whereas if that write that manuscript is on your to-do list for month after month after month, and you're not making progress, it feeds into that burnout cycle, and then you become less engaged and you don't feel productive. Um, they talk about doing the worst first, so that's the eat that frog concept. Just get it done, get it over with. And you can even reward yourself. So if there's something that you, you know, checking email, that's something that's hard for you to not do, or drinking coffee in the morning, or whatever might be your reward, taking a little break, you can get that done and then get your reward, save it for afterwards so that you'll get your, your chunk of work done. Um, creating an audience. So if you set up a time with your mentor or whoever's working with you, you say, like Wendy said, in two weeks, come back to me with the introduction. If you've set an audience for your work, you've created this artificial deadline, then you will be more likely to get it done. Because now you're, you're, you're trying to meet somebody else's um, expectations. Same, that's the same idea with like, deciding to do an exercise class with somebody, right? You'll go together because now you're keeping each other accountable. So creating an uh, audience for accountability. Making an agenda of exactly what you're going to do and laying it out so you set the sign aside. Racing the clock, that's setting your own like artificial deadlines. So again, those important but not urgent things are not urgent because nobody set a deadline for them. So if you can create your own deadlines or deadlines with your mentor, that will help you. And then sometimes you just have an unproductive day. And it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you've been in office since the morning, and you've been chatting with coworkers, and you've been on Facebook a little bit, let's be honest. And you did this or that, and you're like, ah, I've not accomplished anything today. Just take a do-over. Just go take a little walk. Go, OK, I got three hours left. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to close my door. I'm going to focus. I'm going to use rescue time to turn off all the apps. I'm going to plant my tree. And I'm going to really focus and do a do-over and just get a little bit done. Um, and the, if you can just check one small task off, again, you're going to feel that accomplishment. Uh, this is the tree focusing out, which I think is really cute. OK, one of the things that tends to distract us a lot is email. Most time management experts in business will say to set a few times a day that you're going to check your email. If you have those notifications coming in over and over, it can be really distracting. And one of the things that happens when you, when you refocus your time to check your email and then come back is you lose time with that task switching. So you're working away, on, you're really in the groove, you're working on your thing, and then some, you see some emails have come in, you know, oh, I should check those. So you go to your email. And then you deal with all that, and then you come back to your writing, and now it takes you five, ten minutes to get back in the groove, figure out where you were. So you've lost that time. Um, and if you, if you really look at it, the vast majority of those emails that you're looking at aren't, aren't that important. They could wait a few hours. So you could wait. You could just say, I'm going to check it. You know, I'm going to have my focus time from 8 to 10 AM, really get something done. My reward is that I'm going to check my email and, and get that kind of feeling of, not checking my email out of my system. And then I'm going to check it again. At, I'm going to leave it, let it go, and I'm going to check it again at 3 PM. Whatever times work for you. And maybe it has to be more than twice a day. Maybe you just can't be away from your email that long. But still setting those times so you're not constantly doing it as every notification comes in can help you with that task switching. Um, turning off the notifications, unsubscribing, that's a big one. Uh, you, you tend to get, at, when you go to conferences, when you just click on a website, you get subscribed to things. And just being really diligent about unsubscribing will kind of empty your inbox of those unwanted emails. And then organizing your emails so that you can find what you need later. Uh, again, you can spend a lot of extra time looking for an email if it's not well organized into folders. Avoiding unnecessary replies. And I think in the workplace, you get a lot of someone sends this out to everybody, and then someone else says, oh, congratulations. And then someone else says, oh, congr you know, try to get your workplace to not reply to all and not to give a lot of unnecessary replies. So you can just say, you, you can just read the email and get the information. You don't necessarily have to reply to it. The next thing about time management is that you need to be organized. Um, obviously, being organized at your desk and at work is really helpful. Uh, I think sometimes when people talk about getting organized, OK, I need to clean up my desk. I need to get my projects and folders. And it seems overwhelming. You're like, I don't have time anyways. I'm trying to get time. How am I going to spend three hours cleaning up my desk? But if you realize, if you just put the time in now, it'll save you so much more time later. It's worth it. So then, again, it comes to scheduling it. 
blocking out some time in your agenda and say, I'm going to use these three hours to really clean out my, my office, make it a nice workplace, get all my projects into individual folders with everything I need into those folders, get everything organized so that I can be productive when I'm ready to work. Um, and one of the things that people talk about, with, particularly with projects, that's really helpful is having it in some sort of folder, something laid out. So let's say you're working on a book chapter. You've got a bunch of articles that you have, you've, notes you've taken, um, organization. And you get all of that into a folder and organized. And you have a little time to work on it. You can open your folder and get going. Whereas if you don't have your stuff all together, every time you sit down to write work on that chapter, you have to go back and find everything. And oh, where did I put that article? And where was I to have those notes? You don't have it all together. And you spend a lot of time each time with your startup process. Uh, if possible, they say if you have a big project and you can leave it out, laid out, that is helpful. Because then you can just get right back into it and work on it right away. Um, the other thing that I find really helpful is apps to use both in your work and home life. Um, I use Evernote, but there are a lot of other ones you can use that you can make lists, you can clip things, things you need to remember. You can use it to organize your projects, to organize various aspects of your life. Um, for travel, I use TripIt. There's other ones, but it can be very helpful to have all of your travel knowledge, hotels, everything in one place, flights. Um, using a cloud management, so Google Drive, or Dropbox, uh, any of those, to keep all your files. Um, anyone who's ever lost a file knows that you want to back things up. And some of these cloud thing, uh, items have taken away the need to do that. So if you're working on the cloud, they'll automatically back you up as you go. You'll never lose anything. You never want to lose a huge amount of work that you put into something. Also, though, with the cloud, wherever you are, if you've got a, some time and you can do some work, you don't have to necessarily have your computer with you, right? You can have an, a, a tablet. You can even access it on your phone. Um, you'll be able to get to your files. If someone asks you something, you'll be able to reply and look up the files. Um, Secure Safe is something I use for passwords. There's a lot of different apps you can use for that as well. But how much time do we spend trying to remember passwords, look up passwords? If you just have that all in one place, that can be really helpful. And then for those of us, particularly who have kids, getting organized at home. So it's really important to have a calendar. Uh, particularly that everyone in your family can see. Uh, I kept an online calendar, and then once a week on Sunday nights, I would write the calendar on a dry erase board for the whole family. And we had that in a prominent place in our house so that everyone could see what was going on. It also made me sort of uh, plan out every Sunday night. I would sort of be like, oh, oh my goodness, I didn't realize we had this, and I've got to find carpool for that. So it makes you kind of realize what you need to do for the next week by planning it out. Um, and having everything on the schedule helps you to time, manage your time and know when you're going to have those blocks of time available. Uh, as a working mom, I was also very proactive. So I literally learned that there was a master calendar in the elementary school in the back, and I just marched back there and looked at it. Because what would happen is there would be, you know, bring your mother to school day, and I wouldn't find out until three days before, and I had a shift, and I couldn't trade it. So I had to be proactive and go and look and find those dates. When's the third grade school play? Oh, it's going to be in May. They, they already know a lot of times. They're just not telling the parents, um, particularly my community, where a lot of the um, parents were not necessarily working. So I would go and find all those dates. So there's a, a team. There's a coach. I'd find out right away, do you plan to have an end of your dinner? Do you know when that's going to be yet? Uh, get all the games. As soon as they came out, put all the games in there so that when I do my schedule requests, I was able to put what I needed off. Uh, and you'll save so much time. Because what happens instead, if you're not proactive about that, is you find you want to go to this or that activity. Now you've got to trade your shift. Now you're spending a lot of time trying to find a trade. And you're taking a, an unadvantageous shift in return to get that trade. Now you're not sleeping because you took some unadvantageous shift. So if you can just be organized with your calendar and your time from the start, you'll save yourself so much time in the end. And then these are ideas for getting organized at home. Again, it's all on the website. Um, I like to keep a lot of lists. We keep a list, of course, what you need at the groceries, what you need at the store. Uh, we keep a dinner ideas list because my husband's a critical care physician. And we come home and we're like, what do you want to have for dinner? And both of us have made so many decisions at work all day. We, just, we don't have any decisions left in us. And so we, we have a list. And we're like, OK, well, that's good. Let's do that. Um, but you know, a list of things that we can, that we can make quickly. Um, I, I try not to be gender specific, but in our household, uh, I am the one who will look out and see like this needs to be done and that needs to be done, and it's bothering me every time I walk in the house and I see that. 
My husband will not necessarily see those things, but he'll be happy to do them if I point them out to him. So what was very helpful for us was having a dad's to-do list so that I could like say, these things need to be done in the house. Um, and then just every time I would see them, it would bother me, but if somehow if I wrote it down on a list and I knew we were gonna get to it at some point, it didn't bother me as much anymore. Um, one thing I did with the kids was I got all these poker chips and I wrote a whole list of thing, different things they could do. Write a play, make a restaurant, read a book, clean your room, whatever. And I put it all in there and every time they came to me and said I'm bored, I was like, go to that box, get a poker chip out. <laughs> um, but it, you know, saves some time in terms of trying to entertain them. Uh, with young kids, it can be really helpful to plan their outfits out for the week. It will save you time in the morning, uh, it'll save you tears. You can say, hey, we agreed to this on Sunday. This is what you're wearing. Um, it also, it, kids have all these special days. So you have to wear silly socks on Friday, and you got to wear your pajamas to school on Wednesday. And being the working mom, I was always the one that the kid came home like, we were supposed to wear pajamas, and I wasn't wearing pajamas, and it was awful. My life is over. So if I could remember that those needed to be done, I can put it ahead of time. Um, planning, planning your dinners for the week, planning the lunches ahead of time, and then stocking up, making sure that you have everything when you have kids, you're going to want to make sure you have poster board in your closet because that kid is going to come to you at 10 p.m. and say, I need poster board for tomorrow. So, but being stocked up, I would have a gift closet so that whenever someone said, no, oh, this birthday party is suddenly this week, or we need to bring a new unwrapped toy to the school for this or that donation, I was ready to go. So stocking up with homework supplies, stocking up with everything that you might need. When my son was on soccer team, I always bought extra uh, uniform and socks. That way I never had to worry about something not being washed. Um, just being ready for all those things. All right, moving into the next time management tool, delegation. So you want to think about when you've listed all the activities that you're doing and you're looking, you've identified the low value activities, what can I delegate? What can I outsource? What could I do less well? And what can I not do at all? And this is a list, it's on of things that you could look for services. It, it might feel funny, like, am I really going to hire somebody to do these things? But if you really map out your time and you look and you think about the fact that saying yes to doing something like housework or gardening or something that maybe doesn't float your boat is saying no to other time, like exercising or spending time with your kid or getting that grant written, then maybe it becomes less, less weird to hire someone to do something along these lines. Um, you want to prioritize what's important, delegate the rest. You can look for win-win situations where you delegate something to someone more junior, but make sure that's something that would really benefit them. Uh, when you do delegate to someone, you can't just set it and forget it. You still have to kind of measure them through completing the task, but at least it should be a little bit less time on your, on your side. You delegate down, that's mentorship, and that decreases your burnout because you're helping somebody junior to you learn. And, and, and we all have someone junior to us. You know, we have residents. Even if you're junior faculty, there's residents, there's fellows. Uh, there's medical students. So you can mentor someone, but also don't forget to delegate up. And I think Dr. Hochberger talked about that. A lot of times your mentor or your chair can get something done like that that would take you hours. So if you're really struggling with something, just talking to your supervisor, your chair, like, I'm struggling to get this done. I, I can't, you know, get the ortho person to talk to me so we can get this policy written. Whatever needs to be done, delegating up can be helpful as well. The next thing we talk about is multitasking, and multitasking, most time management effort, uh, experts will tell you is not really a thing. You can't really multitask. So you're really just task switching. We talked about how you lose a lot of startup time when you switch back and forth between tasks. So multitasking, the art of messing up several things at once. Um, and they talk about busy versus productive people. So busy people look like they're doing a lot. They're going, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're going back and forth, but they're not actually being productive and doing anything that's furthering their career. So when I talk about multitasking, I'm more talking about double dipping, being able to do things that work for more than one, one part of your career or for work and home life. So if you write the background of a grant application, can that become a review paper? Can that become a chapter? Can that become a lecture that you give somewhere? Um, and then just at home as well, you know, uh, it, I, we have our, exer our exercise machine in front of a treadmill, so we watch our shows while we get our exercise done. Um, at my kids' soccer game, sometimes I was running around the field, you know, in between, and, and, you know, getting my exercise that way. And then being ready for little chunks of time. 
So having those journals in the car so that if you're waiting on pickup, you can read a little bit of your journal, whatever you need to do. Um, there's like little seven-minute exercise apps. You're just being able to use your small chunks of time wisely as well. And some of the different double-dipping things uh, people suggest that I've seen through the years, bringing one of your older kids to a meeting with you to really spend some special time together when you're um, in that city. It's going to be a way to, to see a city as well. Uh, being sure that you schedule time, particularly with your spouse. Uh, again, that's going to fall by the wayside if it's not on your calendar. Uh, I did, I read, for my pleasure reading, I read most of my kids' assigned English books when they were in high school. It was a great way to really touch bases with them. Um, they would surprise me by talking to me about the books, and they were great books. Uh, I read, you know, Looking for Alaska, which I never would have read. Um, and there were books that I had sort of missed. I never read To Kill a Mockingbird when I was a kid, so I got to read it when my kids were in high school. Um, Writing a PTA newsletter article, maybe something that you're an expert at. You can also do something for the school. Um, my kids did something called CPR in schools. It was a great way to connect with them. Uh, so there's different ways that you can kind of bring your home and work life together. Um, technology is another thing that's important for work life, uh, for time management. Um, and you might say, I don't have time to learn to type. I don't have time to like, spend on a typing program. But if you think over a lifetime, if you're not a good typist, if you just spend those hours to learn to type, you'll save yourself so much time over a lifetime. So most of us as junior faculty probably good typists. We grew up in the digital world, right? But there's other things. Learning how to use an Excel program, all the different things that you can do on Excel, or learning how to do a, a biostatistical software program. Uh, so taking that time to learn the technology may save you lots of time in the end. So you really just need to block it out and go ahead and do it. Um, Talked about using cloud storage, project management apps, learning how to Skype into a meeting. Maybe you don't need to come in and actually attend the meeting. Maybe you can Skype in if that was going to be the only thing that was going to require you to do the hour commute in and the hour commute home. You're going to lose all that time with commuting. Um, and then a big one for us, I think, is charting. For some, for some probably more, for some less, depending on, on how much your residents chart and how much you have to chart separately. But if you are spending a lot of time charting, and you'll see that on your time management logs, doing everything you can to speed that up. So getting those dot phrases in order, getting those pre-completed notes and macros. The residents all know how to do this. But if you're, if you're having time where you um, are spending a lot of time on that, making sure that that's up to date. And um, when you finish your shift and you have to do some charting, the most time efficient people either leave, so they don't continue chatting with people and go chart somewhere else, or they put on headphones. So that's what our residents that are very effective do. And then that kind of sends a message. I'm charting, and then I'm leaving. So don't talk to me. Um, but at least then you get your time efficient. Because again, remember, if you're saying yes to sitting around at the end of your shift and chatting, you're saying no to going home to your family and spending that time. Um, technology at home. You can, there's a lot of different technology that you can use to get that dinner on, to do that fast. Um, this is all sort of covered on the website, but there are things that you can use at home. And then the last topic is sleep. And I think all of you know that our circadian rhythms get messed up. There is a lot of good research on what we can do to optimize our sleep and our circadian rhythms. And this is, uh, infographic is from a BMJ article. They do recommend that you don't do more than two night shifts in a row. Uh, preferably is to have one night shift. I know that that can, okay, so some people are laughing. That may be really hard. Uh, and the younger you are, I will say, you guys are junior faculty. You can get away probably with a little bit more than, uh, than, but as you age, it gets a little harder. If you're finding that you're doing a lot of night shifts in a row and it's really not working well, then that's a time for the department to sit down and think about how they can, how they can work on that. Because there are other things, that, there are schedules where, for example, a department will have one or two faculty do the majority of the night shifts for that month, and then the rest of the month they get to be in the, the group of faculty that don't do very many night shifts. So if you're going to go ahead and do four or five night shifts in a row and just really make your circadian rhythm become nights, then that's great. You can do that for a month and then change your circadian rhythm back to days. It's the back and forth that gets really hard. So for me personally, I'm a night, night person. I've chosen to do all swings and nights because honestly for me, getting up and getting in at 6.45 a.m. for a day shift is much harder. So I will do two nights in a row. That's not a problem for me because I'm, I'm staying on that late night circadian rhythm. So it's all about staying on one circadian rhythm or another. Um, but when you do finish a night shift and you're coming home to sleep, 
having the UV light blocking sunglasses so that you don't get that light hitting you, having a nice, dark, quiet room to sleep in, and really, you know, talking to the people in your household, making sure that you're going to respect your sleep time, putting in those shades. Again, it's all about investing a little bit of time to get that more ideal thing. And we talk about it, like, yeah, I should. I should put shades in my room. I don't sleep well. We don't do it, right? So set it. Put it on your agenda. On Saturday, I'm going to Home Depot. I'm going to get shades. I'm going to put them up. And, the, and then that time invested will save you so much time in the future if you just do it, right? Having earplugs, um, having white noise can help some people. There's now things called pink noise. It's like slightly different frequencies. Um, and brown noise, and sometimes that can be more helpful. Uh, having less screen time right before you're trying to sleep and not trying to exercise right before you're trying to sleep and not scheduling a bunch of meetings after a night shift. Um, to be kind of scrupulous with your schedule and say no to the meetings post-night shift. Uh, but trying to get ourselves sleep, that again makes wellness, it makes productivity. If we're sleep deprived and we're not being productive, we get in that cycle where we're not productive, we don't feel good about ourselves, we don't feel like we're achieving, and it gets into a bad cycle. Um, as EM doctors, we have a lot of skills already that are great for multitasking and work-life balance. We know how to prioritize. We know sick from well, right? We can prioritize important from not important. We can multitask. We go from patient to patient easily. We make choices quickly. Uh, we accept less than perfection all the time because we don't have like the full history. We don't have a lot of um, all the information. We're good at communication. We're good at conflict resolution. We have flexible work hours, which is really a boon when you're parenting that you can. If you schedule your time well, you can participate in a lot of things. Um, and we are not that phased by night shifts, so when we have young kids waking up at night, we're used to that as well. Um, I do like this, this blog post about the choice minimal lifestyle. Again, I talked about decision fatigue. If you can get to a point where the small decisions you can just make quickly and move on and not belabor, that's really important. So he talks about setting like a money risk limit, $50, $100, whatever it is. If, if making this decision is going to be the difference is less than $50, I'm just going to make one and move on. I'm not going to belabor it and really think about it. Um, making it so that you automate decisions. You know what? If your family likes grilled cheese for dinner every Friday, don't feel bad about having to have variety. That's a decision you took away now, right? You can just have that every Friday, and everybody's happy. So not postponing decisions, not belaboring decisions, and uh, can help you with your time management. This is an article in the interest of time. I'm probably not going to read every single one of them, but it's pretty funny. Um, it came out of Academic Emergency Medicine Reflections in 2009, 10 Signs That You Are an Emergency Medicine Parent. And I, I think I have done all of these. And then a couple final quotes. Um, when feeling torn between family and work, it is important to remember that you suffer from an abundance of blessings. The privilege of doing work that you love and having a family that you cherish are causes for rejoicing in spite of your fatigue and strain. There is no steady state. You will never achieve a durable balance between career and home. Flux is the norm, the only constant. You will always be giving more in one area or another. You are astride a teeter-totter. Don't be frozen in the middle trying to keep it perfectly level. Learn to prance, slide, skip, skid, and twit skitter from one end of the seesaw to the other. And the final quote is, imagine life as a game in which you are juggling five balls in the air, and you can name them. Work, family, health, friends, and spirit, and you're keeping all of these in the air. You're soon going to learn that work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. But the other four balls, family, health, friends, and spirit, are made of glass. If you drop one of these, they will be irrevocably scuffed, marked, nicked, damaged, or even shattered. It will never be the same. You must understand that and strive for balance in your life. And so these are the time management tools that we reviewed, and they are all on the website with a lot of links and more detail there.